Okay. So thanks for being here. Thanks Thank for you. Coming to the UI. Um, and the, the first question we wanted to ask is, uh, so your first book was on Kashmir. Mm -hmm. uh, this is 97, 96? Yes, correct. So it was a time where there was an, a lot of interest on Schmidt, and so why Kashmir? Why Kashmir? That's a good question from a long time ago. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think at the time, I, I was attracted, I had come out of a Frankfurt School tradition. Uh, I was very attracted to the thought of the Frankfurt School, in particular, the relationship between the critique of instrumental rationality, the critique of technology in the Frankfurt School, and the relationship of technology to domination, political domination. But there was always more emphasis in Horkheimer and Adorno and Marcuse and those figures on the technology part and less on the political part. And so when I first came to Schmidt, when I was first introduced to Schmidt by my dissertation advisor, Stephen Holmes, um, I could see that Schmidt had this side which was very strongly anti-instrumental rationality, very strongly anti-technology, with a much more pronounced political side. And so I wanted to see, even though the political side of it wasn't exactly uh, what I would endorse politically or morally, I still wanted to see what the connection between technology and politics was uh, on the question of domination and on the question of, of justice. And so that was my motivating factor in engaging Schmidt at the time. Do you feel that uh, Americans read Schmidt differently than Europeans? Uh, yes. It's a, it's a very interesting uh, dilemma. Um, I engage a lot with people who study both Carl Schmitt and study Leo Strauss. And I find this phenomenon to happen. The Germans get, or the Europeans get very upset that Americans seem to be not troubled by Schmitt's authoritarianism and that they're interested in, they want to kind of sidestep that to see what they can draw from Schmitt. And I, Americans just don't understand why why are you so obsessed? Why are you getting so obsessed? And it's, it's not just the, the National Socialism problem, it's also the fact that for Europeans and for Germans in particular, Schmidt had such an influence on right-wing politics and thinking in the post-war era. So as far as they're concerned, Schmidt was a very much, he was not a Weimar figure, he was a post-war figure as well. And so he was, he was a, an enemy and, and someone to combat in everyday politics in the present, which we Americans didn't understand. Similarly, um, a, a lot of scholars who are interested in Strauss uh, in the United States now see Strauss becoming more important in Europe. And they, the Europeans seem uninterested in Strauss's politics, and they just want to explore political philosophy and, and at, at a more abstract level. And those of us who have been, for, for better or worse, engaging with Strauss and his students politically, we say, no, 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 but you can't. You can't take the politics out of out of Strauss, so it's a it's a very similar phenomenon. Um, so I think that that's a good way I would say of characterizing the differences between our great conservative thinker and how Europeans engage him, and Europeans' great, for better or worse, conservative thinker and how Europeans versus Americans treat him. Yeah, but beyond that, I have a sense that when you study Schmidt from. Uh continental teachers, there is a metaphysical layer that is larger than, in a sense, Americans see it through pragmatism a bit, his political notion? You, um, so you're thinking of more the post-structuralist reception of Schmidt rather than the constitutional legal engagement with Schmidt in America, because so people who kind of read Schmidt as if he were Heidegger, a kind of second engagement with Heidegger and, and getting interested in the, the his metaphysics rather than his politics? No, my sense, perhaps also that, but my sense is more that how much Paul Kant's reading of Schmidt is exceptional. This notion of sacrificial is very strange to uh, read in Schmidt in the United States. Usually, usually the sense is um, the notion of the pol political, Schmidt understood it in a very existential way, is a bit different than how Americans read it. That's my sense. I think if there's always been a kind of diffuse uh, treatment of Schmidt. I think Paul Kahn, they were predecessors of Paul Kahn. There was a guy named uh, Pan, P-A-N, who published in Telos for years, who was interested in, uh, for instance, the sacrificial element in, uh, in Schmidt. So, uh, so I would say that there, Paul Kahn is not necessarily such an exceptional figure. 
And so I, I want to sort of shift back and move a little bit because um, something that really intrigued me seeing your sort of CV and your trajectory is so you start doing Frankfurt School, a lot of this kind of continental 18, sorry, 19, 20th century German political yeah. social thought, uh, two books out of that, edited volumes, articles, and then there's also this parallel interest in Machiavelli, mm -hmm. Renaissance political theology, Cardini and Machiavelli. How did you see these two, I know, projects or big agendas holding together? How, mm -hmm. What's the sort of connection between those? Well, uh, this is something I recognized after the fact. I certainly wasn't thinking of it at the time when I was interested in both Schmidt and Machiavelli, but in some sense there's an enormous parallel between the Weimar Republic and the Florentine Republic of 1494, that they're, they're both uh, republics in crisis. They're both republics that were uh, kind of ex post-authoritarian experiments with democratic republicanism uh, that were undermined by oligarchic coups and oligarchic conspiracies. and. Uh, and so, uh, of course, Schmidt was the agent, or partly the agent of that, the overcoming of the Weimar Republic, and Machiavelli was a steadfast uh, defender of, of the popular government in, in Florence. But still, the analysis of Machiavelli and Guicciardini of that republic and what was plaguing it and what its problems were, uh, and also Schmidt and his interlocutors, and more progressive interlocutors like Neumann Kirchheimer, uh, Heller, Kelsen, etc., etc. So they, these these republics, these democratic republics, and these constitutions in crisis are two two very parallel cases of democracy in trouble. And as in Athens, as in the Athens of Plato, it's in times of political crisis that some of the best and most deepest and most profound analyses of politics emerge. So this is really interesting because one sort of question I had about this is, so is it, and I saw this in, in your Machiavelli book, that, that there's an interest in what we can learn from Machiavelli and sort of, there's an approach to history that's that, you know, the Cambridge style really bring a lot of context and, and try to really uh, flesh out, I don't know, original intentions, or, but it's more learning and, and really seeing an isomorphism perhaps between say Weimar and Florence in this case, is that the spirit that you, this is how you read these sources. Is it really about, you know, maybe a sense that we are now in a contemporary crisis and, and we have to look at these other crises to, to get a sense of, of, of a solution or, or yeah. some light of... I, uh, I think that was very much, you know, when I started the Schmidt project, it was very much just an intellectual project. I wanted to see what Schmidt was doing with a critique of rationality that the Frankfurt School hadn't done. But over the course of doing that project, I could see, well, I was experiencing the, a kind of right-wing resurgence in the United States. And, a, and that's when it, I had already started the project, but I could see some resonances of, of Weimar in the United States of the, the Clinton era, um, and which you know has in many ways only gotten worse over time. And the transition from not Schmidt in particular, but from a kind of Frankfurt School orientation, I would say, you know, my, my orientation in the Schmidt book and in the Weber Habermas book was a kind of Hegelian, Hegelian Habermas, a Habermas, the pre-Kantian turn Habermas. And that was my political orientation and that was motivating my work. And I, th I think subconsciously, not necessarily consciously, uh, I began to see that a Hegelian Habermasian orientation was not going to be sufficiently robust to confront the contemporary problems of oligarchy, of right-wing ascendance, um, of the collapse of the left, the collapse of the working class, the middle class, rising inequality in, um, in all over the developed world. And Machiavelli was inside, I kind of turned to Machiavelli as a kind desperate. of, yeah, a desperate <laughs> attempt to, to have somebody more Someone who plays less nice than Habermas, who plays very nice and commendably so. <laughs> so, uh, we spoke earlier about um, military as a mechanism for accountability. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you can connect it to the current situation in the United States when you have a military that is not a draft military, yes. but a, a professional military. How do you see that? What's working out? Oh, I think that's 
Obviously, Machiavelli would have a severe criticism of a kind of a volunteer army. I mean, Machiavelli's, the way I understand the discourses, it, it's very hard to disaggregate whether the, the point of the discourses in book one is for empire or for liberty, right? And those two things are, you can, you can never determine which one comes, is prioritized by Machiavelli. He kind of lays them out together. So I think he finds them both that uh, an armed populace, a fully armed populace, or as he often says, as fully armed as possible, uh, is the only way of securing liberty for that populace because it's, it's only uh, a fully armed citizenry that extracts concessions conducive to liberty from elites. And without that, you have very unaccountable elites. I mean, since undertaking the Machiavelli project and looking not only at the republics and democracies of the ancient world that he looked at, but if, if you think about the, um, the severe measures that ancient republics took for military malfeasance or incompetence and how severely they punished their generals and military planners, this was just this cast in relief the way that, for instance, George Bush II and Dick Cheney walked away scot-free from, from basically expending, as we say, more, more blood, lives, and treasure than is remote on both sides, um, than is remotely justifiable. And, you know, I can't help but think in a Machiavellian framework that there's no way that a vibrant ancient republic would have let such citizens go unpun unpunished, go without being exiled, or, you know, Machiavelli didn't like exile, he preferred execution, uh, would have let them go unexecuted for such a, a, a massive, massive mistake. Uh, and also just the way they treat uh, soldiers who have come back from the war. It's a disgrace. I mean, you, you know, Machiavelli, if you read The Art of War, the way society and the military are have such a reciprocal relationship for Machiavelli. The idea that, that soldiers coming home would then be left to fend for themselves, would be shut out from the common wheel that they were defending, and yet that, that's also what we, that's the other injustice of the kind of mili military arrangements we have in the, in the United States. Um, so you, you know, it's only a select few who bear the burden of war, and then when they come home from doing it, they're not even rewarded um, or taken care of for their uh, pain, suffering, harm, etc. So the, the Machiavelli's, Machiavelli's martial republics give us a really stark contrast to um, America's, America's attempt to conduct military affairs on the cheap, you know, with, without, any, without any consequence for those who direct people to war. I want to talk about another crisis, the, the European crisis, and yeah. sort of coming back, uh, coming from your book, uh, um, I was really struck uh, by this uh, contrast between the welfare state and the social state, and the, what you call the sectoral state. Yeah. As, I don't know, sectoral state, I don't know what would be the term. Yeah, yeah. sectoral state, sec sectoral states. Right. Uh, and the, uh, a very important claim in the book is that we need to think about the EU and EU integration in a very different way. We need new concepts, basically. Right. And we, need, we need to understand this creature that's emerging in a very different way. And so Habermas, you criticize Habermas for, for being too attached to older ways of thinking about the state. And, and, and so, but, so this book came out almost 10, ten years ago. I mean, you were okay. researching the book 10 years ago or yeah. more. And a lot here, of in fact. It started, that project started here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so a lot has happened since, obviously. Yes. And, uh, and I was wondering, so do you think that the recent crisis, what's happening, the uncertainty right now, would you write a different book now, say? Would you, do you think you need to really, we need different concepts yeah. now? And, and how, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I would write a very different book now. I was, I was much too comfortable with the idea that you could have multiple sectoral publics that, that each were responsive or accountable to those that it included in its particular policy spheres. Um, and now I see that as just uh, a recipe for elites of different expertises to go un, unpunished and un, unobserved and uh, 
unsurveilled and uh, unmoderated. And so I, I would, I probably would be more Harassian now than I was then. I would be more, more, and say, no, we need a, um, we really do need the national publics and the European public to think more about very classical styles, very classical ways of holding policy elites and economic elites accountable. And that um, uh, it has to be macro, uh, European and national, but not micro in the way that I was confident, too confident that, there, that the micro publics pertaining to each of Europe's policy spheres could somehow keep their respective elites in check. I'm no, no longer, um, no longer sanguine about that prospect. But so that seems to speak to a sort of different understanding, and, and I want to sort of move on to this. Of, I, I feel that you have a, a very, well, maybe not so particular, but I think rare in political theory, understanding of the relationship between normative theory and history, mm -hmm. and a much. You really try to keep them close, in a sense. Mm -hmm. You have you have a very explicit philosophy of history and a very um, yeah, ex explicit understanding of the relation between normative theory and history. And I take it that maybe what you're saying is that well, we need to, you need to be much more normative, perhaps, than you were here. You were allowing history to take its place, exactly. too comfortably. Or that's a, that's that's a that's a very good and serious critique of that book, of the Weber Habermas European book. Um, I think, I, you know, that book had an even more explicit neo-Hegelian orientation than the Schmidt book had, and I think you may be right, I may have been um, either, either fatalistic or optimistic because of some wave of history I perceived to be moving Europe along. I mean, you know, there was a time when I was here at EUI in 90... Seven, 97, 98, I believe, is when I was a Monet here. Uh, I really got caught up in the enthusiasm for the European project, for the supranational project, and I, you know, was taken with the notion of a European democracy and, you know, a, a Europe, a post Christendom Europe that someday would include Turkey and Israel, and uh, that, the, you know, and, and then, of course, um, events both in political economy, uh, the, the various crashes, and then the wars, the geopolitical uh, events, really made me, you know, rethink, or, or at least be less optimistic. History had taken <laughs> some kind of turn from where it seemed to be in the in the mid '90s. So I think you have a very powerful critique, and so that there's a move from Hegel to Machiavelli. It's the move from someone who says, you know, here's history as it's unfolding, and then there's someone like Machiavelli who says, let's make history, let's reverse it or uh, reorient it or redirect it, this is within our power, let's do that. Let's not, let's not just give ourselves over to structural causes working themselves out in history, because God knows where those will go. They, they, all, they don't always go where, you know, Hegel thought they would go to some kind of absolute consciousness. <laughs> so that's an astute uh, criticism. So uh, your, your first book is a book that, um, I don't know, if, if, if this populistic uh, notion of really believing in the, po the, the people, the first book was believing in the people, um, engaging politics, politics in the most deep sense, existential politics, and then you move to uh, um, the second book, which is a belief in, in a sense, decline of politics in Europe and letting people participate not based on... Um, on politics. So what is the current thinking on the role of politics in this Machiavelli book? Because it's a, well, it's a move to, to class politics as a way of overcoming the shortcomings of, of both a kind of unitary notion of sovereignty, popular sovereignty, a kind of left Schmidian view, I would say left Hegelian really, in the first book, um, to, as you say, a couple what turns out in retrospect, I didn't think it was at the time, but in retrospect, an apolitical view in the European Union book to the view that Machiavelli inspired me to think of, um, to think about classes and to think about social forces in terms of classes and that those are the only way and that in promoting class conflict between uh, the few and the many, between the, the rich and the poor, between elites and common citizens, that that's really the only way 
that one can secure liberty and equality. So I, I would say that's, that was what I took out of Machiavelli um, in those, in, during the 90s. So I guess this is probably the last question that I, I want to really raise, but it's, it's a very broad question about how you see the task of a political theory. So mm -hmm. your work has been, you've published in political theory and other sort of journals that are more on the sort of critical side of, of the subfield, but you have also published in the flagship journal, the American Political Science Review, you have also published in law reviews, so you have a very wide range of, of audiences and you, can, and you combine history, intellectual history, social sciences, sociology, philosophy. How, how do you see yourself sort of as a political theorist navigating all these disciplines and discourses? And what's, what's the um, what's distinctive, I guess, about political theory? Uh, well, I, um, the first part of your question, you know, why all of these venues, why very different venues, why a, a political science venue like the APSR or law venues like law journals and more discrete subfield journals like political theory. It's just to try to get as wide an audience as possible. I mean, we have a we have an intellectual uh, world now where things are very much divided. Um, that people don't, even in the same subfields, don't read the same journals. And so I think just to try to reach as broad an audience as possible, I try to pitch my work to different audiences at different times. Um, but you're also asking a deeper, you're asking a kind of Sheldon Bolin uh, political theory as a vocation kind of question too. Yes. You're, you're asking me, so what is the motivation or what is the vo vocation, the vocation of, of a that's right. political theorist? So that's deeper than just audience, you know, finding an audience, although it's related. But I think, you know, um, the political theorist uh, is a question um, of... Plato or Aristotle's philosopher, who on the one hand is doing it out of uh, a kind of hedonism, a kind of a pleasure in knowing the world, learning the world, learning about um, this environment that we live in. It's a kind of sophisticated hedonism, um, a reconstructed uh, Epicureanism of, of, a, of a certain kind, the pursuit, the pursuit of happiness in, in, in the Aristotelian sense. But that's taught, but because, as we know, um, more from Hegel than, than from either Plato or Aristotle, our happiness is dependent on the happiness of others. We can't be happy independently. We can't take, there would be something selfish and uh, too Epicurean in the, in the uh, more pejorative sense of just okay. taking pleasure out of, out of looking at the world. So, so in the process of living the pleasure, pleasurable life of the philosopher or the theorist, one has to also engage the world and make it better for other people to also be happy and to enjoy the world. So, there, so it's also, so not only understanding the world, but in a, in a Marxian sense, changing it too, so that you, what you learn and understand from the world should be presented to an audience to hopefully inspire them to help in a cooperative effort to change the world in a way that, uh, in an old-fashioned sense, in, in a Machiavellian sense, that improves liberty and equality for all. So, so it's a kind of, uh, you know, I think Machiavelli, you can see in reading Machiavelli's work that here's someone who enjoys, greatly enjoys learning about the world and showing what he's learned about the world. And I, I think it was Harvey Mansfield who says, you know, if you don't laugh at least once on every page of Machiavelli's works, you're missing something, you're not reading it right. This is a guy who's taking delight in sorting out the human condition. But on the other hand, he also says, I'm writing for, I'm writing something for, to be useful. I'm writing something to be useful to whoever understands it. I'm writing something for the common utility. So it's also, besides Machiavelli's own learning about the world, he's also putting something out there to hopefully improve it, to make the world strong, because he thinks the world has become weak and so he wants to make it strong. Uh, and my interpretation of what that means to make the world strong is to be is to enhance liberty and equality throughout the world. Well, John, thank you very much. Thank you, Bob.